All right, so this is a little more impromptu because I was told by Elizabeth on Friday that I'm looking for a talk on Monday. So I've been talking to the lung cancer folks about the revised uh, IASLC lung cancer staging, which basically became effective on January 1st, 2018. Um, and so a lot of it is CT, some of it is PET. Uh, would be a good talk for for the residents basically especially if you're giving your boards so um, objective is to be, become aware of the key changes uh, in this new eighth edition of TNM classification for lung cancer <clears throat> and uh, this is basically for non small cell lung cancers and small cell lung cancers uh, bronchopulmonary carcinoids but it's not for you know like lymphomatous involvement of the lung or sarcomas of the lung or uh, mucoepidermoid and other cystic adenoid malignancies that involve, so not, not the rare lung tumors. And <clears throat> why did they change it? Uh, basically, they're trying to match, and this is a little more involved than the regular TNM staging. Uh, they have, it, it's a massive change, uh, and it's a change where, you know, the field of medicine is going and imaging is going. They've involved a lot of uh, groups based on prognosis. Uh, they've involved uh, based on uh, how people uh, will react to treatment and, and how pat like, basically like if you have skip lesions, if you have uh, no N1 disease but N2 disease, then it's classified separately rather than just N2 disease. And uh, they basically have added, we have metastatic disease, uh, which was grouped as just metastatic disease. Basically, if a patient had 100 metastatic lesions diffusely involving the liver and brain and bones uh, versus just one adrenal lesion, both were lumped as metastatic disease in, in the prior TNM classification. So now they have a new group for oligometastatic uh, disease that's separate because they have a little better prognosis and uh, those patients tend to get more aggressively managed because they have a better chance uh, at, at definitive treatment than the latter group where there's diffusely involved disease. Uh, and they also wanted a little more uh, consistency uh, in, in patients uh, for uh, data mining and research purposes uh, across uh, institutions and across countries. So when you say, uh, you know, stage, to lung cancer, um, you know, it could be w whether it was skip, uh, skip metastasis or not. And then also found some other uh, changes that, that uh, with time data has gave. So that all, that's all led to uh, them revising uh, these things. Uh, so this is the uh, older or the seventh edition uh, staging. And so we had T0 or, or TX. Um, where TX was, you didn't identify the primary, uh, T1, T2, T3, T4, and T1 was subdivided into T1A and T1B, and as I used to tease the residents when they rotate through PET, uh, basically uh, uh, the difference between T1 and T2 is a difference between a lung nodule and a lung mass. Uh, if it's less than three centimeters, it's a nodule, and you know, bear in mind that these things do carry uh, significance down, downstream, which the residents uh, are a lot of times they're not aware of. Um, you know, if you don't have a diagnosis of cancer, the ICD-10 code for a lung nodule versus a lung mass is different. And uh, depending on that, the patient may or may not be eligible to get a PET scan. Uh, and so there are, uh, I mean, if you call a 2.8 centimeter mass, uh, the patient may not get a, 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 a reimburse for a PET scan because you call it a mass. And so lots of times I have to rectify it and so it's a lung nodule and a solitary pulmonary nodule is covered uh, indication for PET and all that. So there are, uh, so there ha you have to be uh, consistent and you have to follow the, the guidelines and they're going to be a little more stringent now, uh, especially for all those other uh, vague uh, ground glass opacities and lipidic pattern and uh, atypical adenomatous hyperplasia and uh, you know microinvasive. I'll go over the terminology and and so for especially when you have multiple nodules, how to describe them. Uh, 
because they, they are going to have uh, downstream consequences uh, for management and, and, and financial billing purposes as well. But uh, T1 was divided into T1A and T1B. Uh, now it's going to be divided into T1A, T1B, and T1C. Uh, T2 was 3 to 7 centimeters. Now T2 is going to be 3 to 5 centimeters actually. T3 was greater than, 70, greater than 7 centimeters with less than 2 centimeters from the carina. That's being changed as well. And T4 was invasion of the heart, great vessels, trachea, recurrent, you know. And then the nodal stations have remained same. So N0 is still no regional match. N1 is ipsilateral, peribronchial, or hyalur. N2 is uh, ipsilateral mediastinal. Um, and three is uh, contralateral mediastinal or any supraclavicular. So the, the, these things haven't changed, but now we are going to quantify the nodal uh, involvement and, and, and look at the pattern of nodal involvement. And then uh, M has changed as well. Previously it was just M0 and M1A or M1B. Uh, now there's an M1C as well. And so those are the changes that we'll see. And uh, you know, you look at these things, but lots of times, you know, the residents don't get a, a practical impact of it. Like, lots of times I ask the residents, so what's subcarinal? Is it N2 or N3? And they, they really have to think because they, they, they don't use it when they're reading. Or, or what's precarinal? You know, is it N2 or N3? You know, if you have a right upper lung mass with right hyalur and, and precarinal lymphadenopathy, uh, it's still N2 uh, for subcarinal and precarinal because it's midline, it's not crossing, you're not calling it contralateral mediastinal involvement. And so the residents need to be aware of these things when they read uh, because they do have uh, an impact. So uh, let's start with the three basic pillars of TNM classification. T stands for the primary tumor, N for nodal metastasis, and M for distant metastatic disease. So the primary tumor T, uh, you have to rely on anatomic uh, modalities, uh, routinely CT, but sometimes you might have to uh, use uh, MRI. And uh, again, it's not rocket science to us, but measurements for the size have to be done on lung windows. You, you can't do it on, on soft tissue windows because they change. Uh, so here's an example where it was 4.7 centimeters uh, in the soft tissue window, but in the lung window it was 5.2 centimeters, and it changed from T2B to T3. Uh, so it does have an impact and, and usually you use the longest uh, dimension. Uh, so sometimes the longest dimension may actually be craniocaudal. It may not be transverse uh, or AP. Uh, it could be something else. Uh, so you use the longest uh, dimension to, to get the size. Um, again, CT is the preferred modality, uh, especially contrast enhanced CT with breath holding. Uh, uh, Sometimes you might have to use MRI for better soft tissue differentiation, especially when you're suspecting pleural chest wall or, or mediastinal and diaphragmatic uh, involvement. Uh, but by and large, it's going to be CT. So uh, T1 to T4, again, they have the same, but they have more subgroups now. And again, the, the, the T categorization is based on the long axis diameter for measurement. Uh, you have to look for invasion of adjacent structures. Uh, pleura, visceral, or parietal. Uh, actually, uh, some of the pleura involvement has been taken out now, uh, but you do have to look at uh, invasion of the hilum, mediastinum, uh, great vessels, chest wall, uh, adjacent ribs, those kinds of things. Any satellite nodules, uh, then the location of the satellite nodules, if it's in the same lobe as the primary or in a different lobe, uh, in the same lung or a different lung, and all these have uh, implications, uh, kind of similar to what it was in the seventh edition, but a uh, slight change in the fifth edition. Uh, you have to describe a lot of things, uh, not just the size, but whether there's speculation or smooth margins, whether there are any pleural tags, visceral pleural invasion, whether there's any associated pneumonitis or atelectasis, whether it's invading any other structures, whether the location is central or peripheral, whether there are any separate nodules, you know. In fact, there are actually 24 descriptors that they recommend that you should put in. And if you do a retrospective review of our reports, I challenge you 99.9% .9 of the times we will not have many of these descriptors in our reports. So that's something that we can improve upon 
and as residents uh, you're dictating firsthand so if you get most of these things in it would be good good practice for you as well um, so every centimeter counts especially with the new uh, TNM staging uh, eighth edition uh, because they have split uh, much more uh, categories um, you you basically have to be very careful uh, how you measure it uh, visceral pleural involvement uh, no change uh, location uh, endobronchial lesions t2 and 3t versus uh, uh, lung parenchymal lesions they carry the same prognosis so they're lumped together uh, if there's associated atelectasis the same prognosis um, diaphragmatic involvement uh, has actually been upstaged from t3 to t4 now because the prognosis when diaphragm is involved is worse. Uh, so that got upstaged. Uh, and mediastinal, plural, uh, mediastinal involvement or plural involvement uh, along the mediastinum uh, is actually taken out of consideration for T3 now. So that's no longer considered T3. So T1, as I said previously, it was only T1A and T1B. So uh, 0 to 2 centimeters was T1A previously, and 2 to 3 was T1B, now we have three criteria, T1A, T1B, and T1C. So zero to one or less than one centimeter is T1A, one to two is T1B, two to three is T1C. And so I said uh, every centimeter counts because now there are more uh, more subcategories. Uh, so this is basically a 0.9 centimeter lung nodule, it would be T1A, uh, 1.8 centimeter nodule, non-small cell, it would be T1B by size. Now there's also a size by CT and a size by PAT. Yes, sir. What if it's two centimeters? It's two. It's two centimeters or less, so it would be T1B. Okay. If it's two point one centimeters, then it would be T1C. Okay. Again, it's three centimeters or less between T1 and T2. So up to three centimeters is included. Any other questions? Let's make this interactive. It's better that way rather than just listening and me talking. You know. So uh, T2, previously it was 3 to 7 centimeters, where 3 to 5 was T2A, 5 to 7 was T2B. Now you have 3 to 5 as T2 and more than 5 as T3, okay? So T2A is 3 to 4 centimeters, T2B is 4 to 5 centimeters. So now each centimeter has a different T, T stage up to 5 centimeters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, T1A, T1B, T2C, T2A, T2B, okay? So that's why I said every centimeter counts now. So uh, this is a, a 4.6 centimeter, so that would be T2B, okay? So having accurate size is going to be much more important. Previously more than 7 was T3, now more than 5, or 5 to 7 is actually going to be T3 and more than seven is going to be T4. So that's an upstage. And so here's a 5.2 centimeter by T3 by size. Uh, again, lung windows are important. Bronchial involvement, uh, previously we used to look at involvement of the main bronchus within two centimeters of the carina. That was classified as uh, T3. Now it's T2 and it's regardless uh, from the distance from carina, regardless of the distance from the carina. So if it's less than two or more than two centimeters from the carina, it doesn't matter. As long as there's bronchial involvement, it's going to be T2. However, size uh, takes precedence. So if you have a, a T3 by size, uh, which is involving the, the, the bronchus uh, within two centimeters, it's not going to be T2, it's still going to be T3 because the size is T3, okay? So here, is a necrotic 9.7 centimeter primary uh, bronchial invasion would, it, so if it was say two centimeters primary with bronchial invasion, then it would have been T1B by size, but because of the bronchial invasion, it would be upstaged to T2. This 9.7 is already T4 based on size of greater than seven, so the bronchial invasion does not downstage it to T2, okay? So size takes precedence as long as, so the higher stage takes precedence basically. Okay, um, and, and this one had contralateral nodal disease as well. Uh, if there is any associated atelectasis or pneumonitis, 
you know, previously total at atelectasis of the lobe was T3 and partial was T2 in the seventh edition of uh, TNM, AJCC, TNM staging. Now uh, both are, are just considered T2. So you, you, you basically downstaged. So there are some downstaging actually from uh, total atelectasis from T3 is now T2. So you, you downstage that. Um, so that's good. Treatment? Yes. Okay. okay. If if the patient is a surgical candidate and now because of T two and N zero the patient would be a surgical candidate. Previously T three and zero were considered iffy for surgical candidate. Okay. Uh, diaphragmatic involvement uh, has been upstage actually. Previously it was T three. They found that the prognosis when the diaphragm is involved is as bad as T4, so they actually upstage that to T4. So if there's a clear diaphragmatic involvement, uh, then it's, it's T4. Uh, so, so basically, if you have a 3.2 centimeter mass uh, with diaphragmatic involvement, 3.2 would be T2A, but because of the diaphragmatic involvement, it automatically upgrades to T4, okay? Any questions so far? All right, mediastinal pleural involvement is rarely used, so I just they removed it from the classification. So, uh, you, you, I mean, you can still say it in your report. You should say it if there's pleural involvement, but it's that that's not going to change uh, the T stage uh, if if the mediastinal pleura is involved. Visceral pleural involvement is now so we it's unchanged basically. It's it's still categorized as T two. Uh, uh, so, so here you can see that the plural tags suggesting visceral pleural involvement. Uh, you, so, and those are the things that you do need to mention in your reports. You, you, you end up saying the speculated nodule, but having these things uh, in the report is actually helpful to the pulmonologist and the uh, hemonc and and uh, uh, our thoracic uh, pulmonary folks uh, to to definitely identify uh, the T criteria. And and they have now shown to have prognostic implications. So it's important to have all these things uh, in your report. But it's, there's no change uh, in, in the visceral pleural involvement, VPI as they call it, uh, between the seventh and the eighth edition. So it remains the same uh, as T2. Uh, T3, there haven't been a significant change. Uh, there's parietal pericardial chest wall invasion, pancos tumors, uh, you know, they still remain uh, T3. Uh, we had already, up, from the sixth to seventh, we had already made that change if there's additional tumor nodules, satellite nodules in the same lobe as the primary. So if you have a right upper lung primary with a right upper lung satellite nodule, it was already T3, that remains the same. So nothing has changed much as regards T3, except for, what has changed for T3? Anybody? A few slides back, I just said it. Previously, what was T3? You're asking vagina? Yeah. Total No. Size. The size change, right? Okay. Previously, more than seven centimeters. Okay. Was, you know, three to seven was, yeah. sorry, five to seven was T3. Now it's, it's uh, more than five. Five to seven is now T3. So the size has changed, but the other descriptors as invasion and all that, that hasn't changed, okay? So here's a satellite nodule uh, in the same lobe, so that's T3. Uh, so these are the major changes uh, between the seventh and eighth edition for T stage of TNM. Uh, so we have more subcategories now. Every centimeter up to five centimeters is a different T stage. T1 has now three uh, subgroups, T1A, T1B, T2, T1C. Uh, one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeters, and then uh, T2 is now just three to five centimeters instead of three to seven centimeters, and T2A is three to four, T2B is four to five. Bronchian involvement, uh, now basically irrespective of whether it's within two centimeters of carina or not, uh, it's T, uh, used to be T3 previously, now it's T2. Atelectasis and pneumonitis, uh, partial or complete atelectasis is just T2. There's no separate T3 and T2 for that. Diaphragmatic involvement has been upstaged from T3 to T4. Um, Mediastinal pleural invasion has been taken out as a descriptor and as a factor in considering the T stage. Okay? So, why did they do it? Because th these now match much better with, with the pathological size. Okay, and I, I'm, I'm going over the pathological size a little bit, especially with the invasive components and ground glass opacities and solid components and 
semi-solid and purely ground glass and, and partially solid and, and those things uh, later on when we discuss multiple lesions. Uh, but basically, uh, they, they have a little better, uh, and, and this, is, this is a little worse because, you know, imaging will never pick up micrometastatic disease, so uh, we, we're going to have a little worse prognosis uh, compared to definitive on PAT kind of a thing. So, what happens in, in you know, semi-solid lesions or ill-defined lesions? So, you measure the, the solid component for the clinical size, okay? Uh, for the pathological size, you, you actually measure the invasive component. And so, that's why pathological uh, thing a little, little better matches uh, the survival because there will be, it's, it's impossible for us on imaging to measure uh, the invasive component. We just don't have uh, that resolution kind of a thing. So, uh, what are the implications uh, of the T changed, changes in the T on, in the clinical practice? Uh, it, be certain that you measure the size uh, in the lung window. You measure the longest dimension and you report it because that will determine uh, the T stage up to 5 centimeters uh, or up to 7 centimeters. Um, <coughs> worse prognosis for larger tumors, uh, better prognosis for endobronchial location, uh, total atelectasis and pneumonitis, uh, however, worse prognosis for diaphragmatic involvement, so that's upstage. And this kind of helps in refinement of our uh, prognosis, uh, risk stratification, and, and tailor a little better uh, management strategies based on a little more aggressive for, for tumors that have been upstaged uh, compared to the seventh edition. Uh, and, and it will help uh, better stratification for clinical trials as well. <sighs> Moving on to the N stage. So, anybody can tell me the what's N0, N1, N2, N3 uh, as per the seventh edition? No, since you're dealing with the lung cancer neural disease project with me. <laughs> Okay, so N0 is no nodes involved, NX is you don't know, N1 is ipsilateral peribronchial or ipsilateral hyalur, N2 is ipsilateral mediastinal, that includes subcarinal and precarinal, N3 is contralateral mediastinal or any supraclavicular, so even if it's ipsilateral supraclavicular, it's N3, okay? And then uh, some people like to go by the stations, uh, station 4L, 8L, 10, 11. Uh, some people uh, like to just describe the name like paratracheal, AP window, prevascular, subcarinal, precarinal, hyalur, supraclavicular. Uh, bear in mind if you are using paratracheal, there is a subdivision between upper paratracheal and lower paratracheal nodes, they have a different station. And uh, if you're using descriptive terminology, then that's based on the aortic arch. So if it's above the aortic arch, it's upper paratracheal. If it's below the aortic arch, it's lower paratracheal. Okay. Uh, my personal preference is to use the names because you and the surgeon may not be on the same page as regards the stations. They may have their own, uh, you know, uh, station nomenclature or whatever. So it's just uh, to to take out any uh, ambiguity. You know, if you say right uh, left mediastinal AP window, there's no ambiguity which, which station it is. Uh, so I, 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 per, I personally use uh, the location, but uh, depending on what your referring uh, physicians want, you can have a talk with them and put that in your reports, okay? So what's changed? Uh, so this is what we went through. This is, uh, this is the current or, the, or, or was the current up until December 31st, 2017. Uh, as of January 1st, 2018, uh, the, the, the location hasn't changed, you know. So we still have the same nodal basins, but we now quantify uh, the number of sites, and, and you also see uh, if there are any skipped uh, nodal metastasis, and that has a, uh, has a different uh, end stage now. So uh, basically, if there is a single N1 node, it's PN1A. And if there are multiple N1 nodes, then it's PN1B. Previously, it was just N1, okay? If it was one or multiple nodes, it was just N1. Now, if, if there's one or multiple nodes, it's PN1A or PN1B. Now, if you have a N2 disease without N1 disease, so if you have a right paratracheal, so if you have a right upper lung mass with a right paratracheal node, but no right hyalur node, 
So you are skipping N1 and directly going to N2. Previously it used to be called just N2. Now it's PN2A1. So it's getting complicated. And, and it's going to be, you, you'll have to, if you don't use it day in and day out, you, you're not going to remember it. And so you, you'll have to study really hard for your boards uh, because these will come on your boards. Uh, if there is a, a basically involvement without skip, so if there's P1, PN1 involvement or N1 involvement and uh, N2, then it's PN2A2. And if there are multiple nodes, so right paratracheal, right anterior mediastinal, or right anterior superior mediastinal, uh, or subcarinal or precarinal, uh, then it's PN2B if there are multiple nodes. And then PN3 is as it is. So contralateral mediastinal or contralateral or ipsilateral supraclavicular, which was previously N3, remains the same. So there is a significant change uh, in, in how N1 is going to be classified. And so if there's a single right hilar node, uh, previously it was N1, now it would be N1A. And it was multiple, so two right hilar and, and a peribronchular. N1B. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is N1B. Now, if you have uh, no N1 and a single N2, then it would be N2. N2 what? N2A1. This is this is the other one. This is with N1, no skip method. So if there's a skip node, then it's N2A2. Okay. If there is no skip node, then it's N2A1. Okay. So this is uh, basically skip. Uh, so directly it's going to the paratracheal without, I mean, I'm not showing the, all, all the slices, but without uh, N1 involvement, it would be N2A1. And here you have hyler and paratracheal, that would be uh, N2A2. And if there are multiple N2 nodes, N2B. Yemis is awake. So multiple uh, N2 uh, and then contralateral, there's no change. So contralateral mediastinal or contralateral or ipsilateral supraclavicular is N3, so they haven't changed that. So now you're quantifying the nodes and you're also looking at skip metastasis, which in the seventh edition we were not looking at. In the eighth edition of AJCC TNM staging for lung cancers, we are looking at that. So that's a, a significant change. So here's the summary of, of uh, N staging changes. So again, N0 is no nodes involved. N1A is single N1 station. N1B is multiple N1 stations. N2A, you have if there is a single node, but there is a skip metastasis, then it's meaning no N1 involvement. Then it would be N2A1. If there is N1 involvement with a single N2 node, it would be N2A2. If there are multiple N2 stations or multiple N2 nodal stations, then it's N2B. N3 same, contralateral hilar, mediastinal or ipsilateral or contralateral supraclavicular or scaling nodes. And again, uh, that matches a little bit better with the, with the pathological prognosis as well. So they're trying to match the clinical and the pathological. So clinical pathological correlation is a little bit better with this uh, new eighth uh, edition of TNM staging for, for lung cancer and uh, it just matches a little bit uh, better. And, and so if we can just remember this thing here, that would help. N1A, N1B, N2A1, N2A2, N2B, and then N3 is the same as, as before. So what are the, the practical implications in practice of these changes? Uh, so you basically have, uh, or have a better quantify, uh, quantification about the amount of nodal disease present based on just quoting the N. So previously N1 was just N1. You didn't know if there was one node or multiple nodes. Now you, by splitting it into N1A and N1B, you know the disease burden is a little bit uh, better and, and it might uh, better uh, go with, with prognostic implications. Um, uh, it, so it, it's important to say whether there's a higher node or higher nodes. Uh, because that's going to change the N1 category for that patient. Uh, just saying right hilar lymphadenopathy is very vague. You know, right hilar lymphadenopathy may mean one enlarged node or m several enlarged nodes. 
So you have to say whether you think it's one node or, or more nodes because it's going to change their N1 from N1A versus N1B, okay? So it's very important to be as descriptive as possible in your reports. Um, and, you know, up front, it, it, can, it, it helps better tailor uh, treatment strategies and, and risk stratification based on, and, on prognosis. Uh, moving on to M, as I said, uh, there's been some change in the M as well, especially to accommodate this new uh, oligometastatic disease status where patients tend to have metastatic disease, but it's not floridly metastatic uh, throughout the body. Uh, the, the patients with uh, oligometastatic disease tend to uh, uh, be managed a little more aggressively than patients with tons of metastatic lesions. So uh, PET-CT is the modality of choice except for brain, uh, and uh, for certain lesions, MRI might be better. Uh, for brain, definitely MR. Uh, for liver, sometimes uh, MR may be done, or sometimes chemical shift MRI for the adrenal uh, lesions as well. Uh, by and large, we, we use PET CT and then use MR for brain and then additional MR uh, if if the PET is not uh, good enough to give you a clarification. So uh, intrathoracic metastasis uh, within the lung, uh, no change between the seventh and eighth edition of AJCC TNM staging. Uh, same uh, nodule in the same lobe as the primary, uh, so right upper lung primary with the right upper lung satellite nodule is T3 for both. Uh, nodule in the Ipsilateral lung with a different lobe, so right upper lung primary with a satellite nodule in the right middle lobe or right lower lobe, uh, it would be T4 based on both 7th and 8th editions. Uh, if it was a satellite nodule in the contralateral lung, so right upper lung primary with a left upper lobe satellite nodule or a left lower lobe satellite nodule would be M1A and then malignant pleural or pericardial effusion would be M1A again. So that this, these things haven't changed between the 7th and 8th edition. Uh, what's changed is extrathoracic metastasis. Previously, anything that was outside the chest, so one adrenal met versus six liver lesions versus 10 osseous mets versus one brain lesion versus four brain lesions, all were just M1B. There was no uh, differentiation between a patient who had a T2 N1 disease with right adrenal met versus T2 N1 disease with bilobar hepatic metastasis with multiple osseous mets. They were all just M1B. Okay, now we have uh, a single metastatic lesion in, in a visceral organ, be it brain, liver, bone, uh, as M1B. And so that's the oligometastatic disease and multiple metastatic lesions would be M1C. So they've added this category of M1C which wasn't there previously. So that's that's a change in the eighth edition of uh, TNM classification compared to the prior. So M1A remains the same, per plural pericardial effusions, metastatic disease in the contralateral lung. M1B is changed now to oligometastatic mm -hmm. disease. So isolated adrenal or uh, isolated osseous med. Lots of times we'll, we'll pick up lesion on the PET-CD in the sacrum and that's the only distant metastatic disease. Uh, so that would be M1B versus uh, uh, multiple uh, distant mets would be M1C now, okay? So uh, contralateral uh, lung nodule, this is the primary in the left, contralateral uh, right lung satellite nodule, M1A, as per both seventh and eighth. Uh, malignant pleural or pericardial effusion would still be M1A as per both. Single brain med, would have been M1B by both, okay? It then, uh, but uh, there was no M1C previously. Multiple brain mets or multiple liver mets would have been M1B previously by the seventh edition. It is now M1C uh, by the new uh, eighth edition of uh, AJCC classification, okay? And again, that they tend to be a little bit better uh, with pathologically proven. Uh, prognostification, uh, how these patients uh, do anachronistry wise. So implications for uh, changes in the M stage on clinical practice, uh, basically the number of M's is now, so again quantification of the metastatic disease. So, so there's been a move to quantify disease burden uh, because it's been found to have uh, an impact on prognosis. Um, and uh, that's where the imaging field is headed to because it, it, ultimately, it's like uh, we, have, we want to have an impact on patient management and patient outcomes. 
Uh, so M1B is now uh, oligometastatic. Sorry. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, so again, it's it's all about uh, risk stratification based on prognosis kind of a thing. So this is the new uh, stage subgroups for uh, TNM staging. And uh, as radiologists, we are not expected to uh, know this, uh, whether it's you know 2B or 3A or, or whatever. Uh, but we definitely need to know what is T1A, T1B, T1C, what is N, N1, N2, and, and the subcribes. Uh, of, of the N2 and then M1A, M1B, and M1C. So you, you definitely need to know these. Uh, it's for the treating physician to lump it in the category based on all the investigations and come up with, with the actual stage. Uh, but uh, lots of times they will ask questions on the boards that uh, basically will say you have an X centimeter lesion with a, with a node and uh, based on the NCCN guidelines, what would you do next? And so the NCCN guidelines are based on actually this. So you'll have to come up with, based on the information provided, what's the stage and what do the NCCN guidelines recommend for that? And so that's why, at least for your exam purposes, you need to know this a little bit. But when you go out and practice, uh, mostly you'll be required to know this and this. Okay? but. Some of those questions in, on the boards are now becoming very clinical, and so you need to know uh, at least for your boards. And and I'm sure Yemisi can and can guide you guys about which are the more common. So usually, lung because it's very common, uh, breast, uh, sometimes head and neck, lymphoma. Those are the things that you need to know a little more about this TNM classifications. Uh, they won't ask you as a trick, uh, like you know, say. Merkel cell or, or those kind of things uh, on your on your boards, but lung, breast, you know, those are very common, uh, and you need to know uh, a little more about about the TNM staging for those, uh, at least uh, to do good on your boards. Uh, so now let's move on to the last topic: uh, is the cancer with multiple lesions. And so that's that's lots of times uh, when you see several lesions, you don't know whether it's a second. So so suppose you see two lesions. You don't know whether it's a second primary or a uh, synchronous uh, primary or a separate tumor nodule where one is the primary and other is a satellite. Uh, you, 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 there's a separate thing for multiple adenocarcinomas with uh, ground glass or lipidic features, uh, the pneumonic type adenocarcinoma. And uh, if you're not familiar with these terminologies, I think you, you need to, I don't think I copy pasted it. Uh, but you need to be familiar with uh, these terms, adenocarcinoma in situ, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma, atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, uh, and, and know how they look on CT scan and what their descriptors are. Uh, but basically, uh, for second primary tumors, uh, if it's histologically, if you sample both, and one is squamous, the other is adeno or adenosquamous, then obviously it's a second primary. Uh, they, if they have a, a different radiologic appearance, so one is kind of cavitary, the other is very solid, or if you do a PET scan and metabolically, you know, one is intensely FDG avid and the other is kind of modestly FDG avid, then, then you know that those two are, are metabolically different and unlikely to be the same histopathology. So in those cases, uh, it's easier to, to make the differentiation that those are second primaries. Uh, if they have different biomarkers, if one is growing much more faster than the other, uh, you know, uh, so still sometimes it would be difficult, uh, and lots of times in head and neck cancer you have this issue. You have a, a head and neck malignancy, and you see a lung lesion, uh, and whether it's a second primary or metastatic disease, uh, and and there is literature uh, basically on that as well. Uh, I can show you the papers uh, to differentiate between metastatic foci versus primary uh, in the uh, in the lungs uh, based on uh, the I, I, IASLC data actually. Uh, separate tumor nodules, uh, you know, if you have uh, a one dominant lesion and the other looks similar but smaller, then it's, it's a satellite nodule. 
uh, you can have it within the same lung, uh, same lobe, different lobe of the same lung or different. Uh, it, it's not thought to be uh, synchronous tumors and it should be without uh, ground glass features. Uh, multiple adenocarcinomas with ground glass or lipidic features. Uh, and there's a difference between subsolid and uh, partially solid. Uh, so subsolid includes purely solid and partly solid lesions. Uh, partially solid includes only uh, semi-solid uh, or sorry se semi-solid is, is basically they, are, they have a solid component and a ground glass component uh, but sub-solid is, is it could be purely solid or, or partially solid. Um, they have to be uh, suspected or prone to be cancer with or without biopsy and again uh, this applies to all these uh, you know adenocarcinoma in situ uh, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma that was previously called uh, bronchoalveolar uh, tumors, lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma where the lipidic growth pattern is tumor. So that was the mucinous bronchoalveolar tumors were, are now called lipidic predominant tumors. We don't use the term bronchoalveolar carcinoma, adenocarcinoma a anymore. So uh, if they're not mucinous, then they're, they're called minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. If they're mucinous, they're called lipidic predominant adenocarcinomas. And then uh, AAH is atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. So if, if the ground glass opacification is less than five millimeters and suggesting AAH, then you don't count it towards TNM actually. Uh, so, and the pneumonic type adenocarcinoma. So if you have a consolidation and you don't see the mass very well, uh, it has to be a consolidation or an infiltrate. It cannot be an atelectasis uh, or, or ground glass opacity uh, and, uh, or, or pneumonia like picture. Um, and then they, they, are, they are basically classified as multiple uh, lesions uh, as well. And so if you have multiple primary tumors, then you stage each lesion as a separate TNM stage. So you may have a right upper lung primary and a left upper lung primary. So you have a TNM stage for the right upper lung as well as a TNM stage for the left upper lung. If there are separate tumor nodules, then it becomes uh, either M1A or T3 or T4 based on the location of the nodule. So if it's in the same lobe as the primary, that would be? Anybody? Same, same satellite nodule in the same lobe as the primary. That would be T3. If it's in the different lobe but the same lung, that would be T4. And if it's in the opposite lung, then it would be M1A. Wake up. Uh, if you have multiple uh, adenoma, adenocarcinomas with ground glass or lipidic patterns, then uh, basically you give the highest T size, or you could just say M in parenthesis for saying multiple, and then have the N and M. And for pneumonic type, it's uh, again T3 or T4 and M1A. So here's a uh, uh, TIS is, is no solid element in the ground glass uh, up to three centimeters in size. Come on. Sorry. And uh, T1MI is if the solid component is, is less than 0.5 centimeters, so microinvasive. So multifocal uh, ground glass or lipidic uh, pattern lung adenocarcinomas, uh, you basically go with the highest T dimension, longest T dimension. Or you could simply just put uh, the number of lesions. Uh, so if there are three or four, you could put the number four. So T1A4. You know, so it's it's basically showing that you have multiple lesions or four lesions. Or you could just put M. And T1A suggests that it is less than. Three. T1A one. Yeah. One what? Centimeter. <laughs> So T1A suggests that all the lesions are less than a centimeter, and this is based on the largest uh, size of the lesion, okay? It could be T1B if it's 1.4, and you have uh, three other nodules. Uh, so it would be T1B and three or four. Or you could just put, instead of the num, if there are multiple, you can just put M, rather than counting all the numbers. And then N and M, it's usually going to be N0 or M0. So. Uh, and then if it is a uh, microinvasive, then T1A MI. Uh, so T1A MI is microinvasive. And then you can put multiple, again, if there are multiple lesions of them. So now, now you know why your CT reports are going to be much more important than before.
you have to give the size you have to give those 24 or as many as you can of the 24 descriptors i told you about uh, pleural invasion location of nodule speculated edge whether it's purely solid subsolid ground glass lipidic invasion of any structures where is location are are there any n1 nodal stations or it's just n2 it's a lot of things that and so the the report has to be comprehensive if not they're going to call you and ask your opinion and if you want to decrease your productivity because each phone call you receive you're not reading so that's going to take time and when you're going private practice you're reading 80 to 100 scans a day you know you, you have to decrease the number of phone calls by having as good reports as you want so you know it's, it's better to have that out in your report so that you decrease the number of phone calls you have so as i was saying the the new category is tis uh, is uh, adenocarcinoma in si 2 and uh, mi is microinvasive so that's based on pathological sizes okay so you, it's going to be very difficult for ct to pick that so so that's going to be a lot of pathology involved as well if, if you sample it uh, in, in, in it so here's a question to end up the set, uh, end up the talk uh, the following statements or statement regarding the 8th edition changes in the T categories compared to the 7th edition is correct. Additional categories are introduced based on tumor size. Invasion of mediastinal pleura was deleted as a descriptor. Endobronchial tumors less than 2 cm from the carina and tumors associated with total atelectasis or pneumonitis are now downstaged from T3 to T2. Invasion of the diaphragm is upstaged from T3 to T4, mm -hmm. all of the above. All of the above. So you basically have all these changes uh, in the T stage. And, and CT is going to be uh, the primary modality for this. So in summary, you know, more relevance to tumor size. Uh, so you have to measure the size in the longest uh, dimension. And you have to put it in a report. Reclassification of some of the T descriptors. Uh, and the nodal stations are the same, but you now quantify the M stage, uh, uh, nodal stage. Uh, they added a subgroup for oligometastatic disease. Uh, so all this helps in better prognostic risk stratification and recommendations for you know, uniform staging across institutions and across countries so that clinical trials can better target the right patient subset population for developing novel strategies. Uh, this is just a summary. Uh, T1 is now T1A, T1B, T1C. Uh, T3 is different than what it was for before. Uh, some tumors got downstage from T3 to T2. Some tumors got upstage from T3 to T4. Uh, mediastinal pleural involvement has been deleted as a descriptor. And the nodal stations are the same, but now you quantify and see if there are any skip nodal metastasis. M, uh, M1A same, uh, but now there's a new M1B which signifies oligometastatic disease and if there's more lesions then it's M1C which is a new uh, subgroup which wasn't there before and this will help uh, our capacity to refine prognosis, uh, prompt future research and facilitate a little more homogeneous tumor classification and collection for prospective data. Any questions? So I'm going to look, I look at almost all the reports because we do a pet of the CT. So I'm going to see how much impact my talk had on the reports coming out next month. But my only question <laughs> is if there is any clinical, because one thing is prognosis, or another thing is, for example, before, uh, you know, one or two A was candidate for surgery and now it's not, is there any change in that? In the, in the, you don't say no, the I'm management saying. hasn't been changed. So they, they changed this because previously some, some patients were not considered candidates for surgery. Now in that stage, they include patients who will now be considered for surgery. So management is changing, but for an individual patient because he's getting reclassified in a new stage. Okay, the stage management is the same. But now more or less patients no, so will qualify. Yeah, so, yeah. so management is going to change. They include more patients yeah. in surgical. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's been a pleasure for going through this thorough uh, review and presentation. Uh, my take is a comment. You know, how do you think? It seems to me that everything is increasing so much the complexity in the yeah. analysis that it is becoming more like a, the people involved need to be 
Self-specialized. Yeah, the, the field is moving towards self-specialization. See what I'm saying? And also, I think that reinforces the need to screen the population at risk. Mm -hmm. Because then, I tell you, all these inside tumors that you are showing are very easily controlled locally yes. today with highly focused uh, radiotherapy or any of the addition methods. If you have a tumor that less than one centimeter, you can kill it with anything. In China, for years, they have been doing uh, alcohol ablation. I'm talking about the 90s, early 90s. Dr. D just did love one last year, actually, sir. What was that? Didn't you do uh, an ablation of a lung tumor uh, last a uh, few months back? Well, yeah, I think. And, uh, 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 yeah, the because the patient basically could not receive any more radiation, so they referred to Dr. D for radio ablation. Uh, no, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Right. All right, yeah. So, and, uh, so this is not something esoteric. We do it here too. I'd like to see the results of that. Oh, we did a pet on the patient recently, actually. Yes, That's why I know because I read your note that you did the radio. Did, did, did it work? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I'd like to see the other case. Okay. Because actually, yeah. Unfortunately, what you treated is better, but there's disease elsewhere now. <laughs> That's another issue. Remember, our approach for cancer is the same approach we use for flies. You see that? <laughs> We get it, you know? We don't have a fly shopper or something like that. But the truth is, the essence of the problem has not been managed yet. You know, the relationship between the chronic triggering effect of cancer has not been totally elucidated. So we cannot really treat what we do not know what it is or how it happens. It's a chronic process. Remember, cancer is not an acute problem. The complications that it, they can emanate, like for instance, the lung cancer is a trigger compression or the apparatus of compression. You can bleed to death. Or, um, you know, the, where they bleed, visually at a higher stage, or the obstructive pneumonitis. Those are acute complications that you may need to manage. But the, the rest of the thing is chronic. Right? So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate what you your data, especially I check Dr. Dakalkar's good wheel because we had a hole in the schedule and he filled it in uh, very, very well. Thank, Thank you. you so much.